After decades of conflict and isolation, Myanmar is now on the road to rapid political and economic reform. The once reclusive nation is now one of the world's most compelling investment stories. With the promise of a population of 62 million, a large youthful workforce, and a wealth of natural resources, Myanmar is open for business. But is it ready? Can it balance the inflow of foreign interests with domestic capacity building? Over the next hour, we discuss and debate Myanmar, the way forward, with our panel of experts, Indra Nui, Chairman and CEO of PepsiCo and Co-Chair of WEF East Asia, Helen Clark, Administrator at the United Nations Development Program and former Prime Minister of New Zealand. She's also a co-chair of WEF East Asia. Anand Sharma, Minister of Commerce and Industry for India. Michael Andrew, Global Chairman of KPMG International. And finally, Serge Pun, Chairman of Serge Pun & Associates and also Executive Chairman of Yoma Strategic Holdings. Hello and welcome to the World Economic Forum. I'm Martin Sung. You know, whenever the World Economic Forum gathers or huddles, it brings together or harnesses big business, big brain power from academia, also big multilateral institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, also NGOs, towards one goal. Their big thing is how to make the world a better place. But at this particular gathering, the World Economic Forum East Asia here in Myanmar, it's all about how to help a single country become a better place. And that is Myanmar, and that is why we're gathered here today and what we're going to be talking about, the way forward for Myanmar. You've met our guests already, our experts. Let's launch right into it. Uh, Ms. Clark, uh, you've just been reappointed, second term, excuse me, second term uh, as head of the UNDP. I get confused as well sometimes. So if you take the long view, golfers say, you know, the long game, Say, imagine 20, 30 years down the road, what kind of place Myanmar is going to be? How is it going to get from now here to there? What's the sequencing? Well, uh, I, th I think if we look ahead, we see how uh, other nations in ASEAN have really uh, pulled themselves up. I think regional integration has helped. The opening session today, we heard quite a lot about some of the big regional infrastructure uh, projects which are going to connect people but then come back home here to uh, Myanmar. Uh, I don't think it's a question of whether the economy is going to grow. It's going to grow and grow, and it'll be fueled, uh, of course, significantly by the extractive industry's boom. But that in itself won't reduce poverty and increase uh, uh, the, the living standards of people. So parallel to undoubtedly a resource flow into government coffers uh, from uh, the extractive industries, I think there needs to be a focus on basics like agriculture. Ah. That's where the great majority of people in this country currently are living and working, but it's a sector that needs more investment, more support for the small holders to increase their productivity. Okay. So I'd be putting a big focus on agriculture right now as, as key to lifting right. uh, not only the people of Myanmar, but uh, restoring Myanmar as a significant exporter of these kinds of okay, goods. Okay, excellent. Very good. Let me bring Serge in on this. You know, when people talk and look at development, they look at three basic stages, agriculture, making stuff, manufacturing, and finally uh, services. How much of a, a risk is there, uh, sirs, do you think that too much maybe of the new investment coming into Myanmar is going to be focused on that second layer that is making stuff? Because it's, it's a fast, easy way to create jobs, to lift incomes. Well, there's, there's no shortage of uh, foreign investments that wish to come into agriculture. Yeah. I mean, we have a lot of large agricultural companies, medium size, small size wanting to grow all sorts of things, so there's no shortage of that. Um, in our new foreign investment law, however, there's, there's some passages which, on one hand, um, denotes the fact that we really welcome foreign investments. On the other hand, give some sort of protection or ample protection to our small farmers so that they don't get run over. Mm. So if you, if you read the investment law carefully, I mean, you can come in as a foreign investor, do large-scale farming, big, big stuff, but when you want to go into small stuff, you have 
to abide by certain things, and there are certain restrictions. Mm. So it would be fair to say that as far as our policy is concerned, we actually encourage investment in the agricultural sector. I think it's also very important because, as somebody said this morning, which is very true, we are actually endowed with a lot of good things uh, based, on, based on agriculture. You know, we have a very fertile land, we have a huge mass of land, we have a huge population, 70% mm -hmm. of them farmers, and, and a history. Yet, we are not an agricultural force. Mm. Our produce are sold at lower than other people's prices. Okay? Uh, our, our productivity is low, and that's because of a lack of investment, lack of R&D, lack of technology, and all that can be easily filled in mm -hmm. by the foreign investor. Okay. All right. Interesting. Ms. Clark, is there a lesson to be learned here? Because we were talking about this earlier on a few seconds ago in the green room, and that is that if you take a look at how the North Asian countries have developed, China, South Korea, Japan, and compare them to what's been happening in Southeast Asia, the northern countries have uh, developed and accelerated very aggressively. The South, uh, Southeast Asian ones, though, not so much. P places like Malaysia have hit a bit of a ceiling. The multilats call it a, 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 the middle income trap. How much of a lesson is there to be learned by Myanmar from what's, what's these two different paths of development? Well, I think undoubtedly Myanmar will want to industrialize and, and want to be on the next wave, if you like, of, of, of offshore processing. Uh, but to do that, you need a lot of infrastructure. You need your energy. You, you need your water. Uh, that's why I say the quick wins immediately, I think, are with the, the smallholder agriculture, which, given the opportunity and the incentives, can uh, really move ahead. Uh, but I, I do feel confident that Myanmar can get on a fast track. I've you know, watched from the vantage point of New Zealand over many mm -hmm. years how the, how the ASEAN economies have lifted, and I'm absolutely yeah. confident that, okay. that this economy can lift. I just you know, come here as an advocate for human development and making sure that as it lifts, it lifts the people with it, mm -hmm. and that it can turn the, 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 the wealth from extractive industries into a blessing yeah. that can go back into the virtuous cycle of development, the education, the health care, the housing, okay. uh, the, the infrastructure, the social protection, so that you take everybody with you. For, for agriculture to work the way that you think it should, mm -hmm. is land reform going to be necessary here? And from the talks that you've had with officials, is that where they're headed? Well, I, I don't have any expertise on that, but, but I, lo looking at the, the history of the development of agriculture in many countries, including my own, often starts small. And then as it succeeds and the, the production rises, you start to get the base for further processing, the, the farms amalgamate, you get more scale. Uh, so I, I wouldn't try to start big. I'd, I'd try to start by, by growing that base of the smallholder agriculture so that it can uh, generate its, uh, its own wealth and, and onward to development. Okay. Minister, India's perspective? With respect to agriculture? Yes. Well, agriculture is very important because when you look at the percentage of people in Myanmar who are dependent on agriculture today, it's maybe 58%. Investment in agriculture, and particularly creating the institutions, both for better management of crops, crops diversification, management of water. Water here is abundant. It rains eight, eight months, or if not more, in a year. And that's one of the priority sectors of India's engagement. We have a multifaceted partnership, which embraces critical areas, agriculture being one of them, education, skills training, health care, and also infrastructure building, among others. So we are, in fact, uh, going to work here with Myanmar. It was d decided during the visit of my prime minister last year to establish an institute on agriculture research. And there's another institute on rice, which is being established, mm. the rice bio park, which India is developing. I'm sure that uh, this will help the investments in agriculture and the engagement of the other countries, both the government-to-government -government partnerships which are being built and also the investment, as Serge Bun talked about, with the big companies coming in. It is, will be important, as Helen Clark said, that there has to be a balance, uh, balance to ensure that more people get empowered. Mm -hmm. 
and the investments have a beneficial spin-off. Okay. And that should be the objective because eventually agriculture has to e yield more but the sustenance of the percentage of people on agriculture is bound to change mm -hmm. uh, with the manufacturing, with the industrialization, as it has been the case with other developing countries, including mine. And we can say today, uh, with a large uh, presence of the corporate leaders and institutional leaders from all over the world, mm -hmm. that in the coming years and decades, there's going to be dynamic economic activity construction, manufacturing in this country. Mm -hmm. And that's where that balance as to uh, and the priorities have to be correct. Okay, Ms. Dewey, I'll get it right this time. <laughs> Let me bring you in on the discussion. You're, you're from the second layer, making stuff, Pepsi and a lot of other things, uh, obviously. But you understand implicitly that in order to, to get there, to sell to this market of 60 million plus people, there are a lot of fundamental basic things that have to happen first, and you're very active in that. Uh, you know, as a company that's in food and beverage, um, we need a large consumer base with discretionary income because we are in the discretionary consumables. And the only way to get discretionary income into the hands of the people in Myanmar is to actually build a base uh, and give those people money to be able to spend it. Okay. And so, so you're involved in... So, for example, the agriculture work we've just begun to do in Myanmar is to grow a potato crop, a high yield potato crop, and then buy the potatoes from the farmer so that they have a uh, income stream, okay. and then use those potatoes to make products or export the potatoes to other ASEAN countries because there is no fertile uh, acreage to the extent that Myanmar has anywhere else in the ASEAN country. So this could be a big export zone for critical crops. So our goal is to create this virtuous circle that Helen was talking about and make sure that on the food side, we actually invest in agriculture, but buy the crops back so that mm -hmm. they do get income in their hands. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, invest in skills building. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, you know, we need very good talent for all of our businesses. And there's no point going in with the business model and not having enough people to do it. And so we are working with Yangon University and UNESCO to put in place a skills development university to be able to train a matriculating Stu uh, college students yeah. uh, with basic business skills okay. and that's what we're working on so building the fundamentals and working with the Myanmar government okay. to actually help them in the nation building interesting it seems to me that what you're doing with the potatoes that first bit is smart it's strategic but uh, this is an interesting phrase uh, uh, that we talked about earlier on I said ah oh, this sounds like CSR and you said no this is way earlier than CSR this is simply R absolutely I honestly believe that if you talk about CSR, it sounds discretionary mm. because a CSR program can change if the CEO changes or if you run out of money, you can say or cut the or CSR programs. It's an option. Mm. But if it's a responsibility of a company to do business the right way in a country, mm. then you go in with a model which says the only way you make money is by building the base. Mm -hmm. The only way you can make money and get a license to operate is by doing things right for that country, with that country. Mm. And I think that's two very different concepts. Mm -hmm. We often confuse a responsible corporation with corporate social responsibility. Mm. And I want to make sure we separate the two. Okay. One is a discretionary activity. One is a license to operate. Okay, all right, fair enough. Serge, when you hear comments like this from somebody like Indra, what do you think? Well, I said something this morning about CSR. Um, there's so much talk about CSR, I'm actually confused. Mm. <laughs> so I think what I, I look at a, a company coming in, and I would say, do you have the right conscience? If you have the right conscience to come here, do good for the country, do good for the people, promote um, education, impart knowledge, you're okay. It doesn't have to be a fancy program. If you're coming here to say, I'm going to make a lot of money and run, or where's my profit, it's a matter of conscience. Mm -hmm. So I would like to say that you know, we really have to emphasize and, and, and judge people who come in by what kind of conscience they bring when they come. Here, let me ask you a blunt question. You know, uh, an interesting way is 
been used to describe the situation in Myanmar now with regards to foreign investors. A lot of people are sniffing around, but not a heck of a lot of actual capital has been uh, committed. Um, I'm curious whether there's also a risk in Myanmar, as, as there has been in, in China, of foreign companies coming in with the exact opposite view. That is, look, it's such a dangerous, risky place. I better make my money while I can, take it and run. It, do you, is that fair? Is it prevalent? Then no, it's not fair. I think if you, if you come in thinking that oh, this is a dangerous place, highly risky, I better make my money quick, I think you should stay home. Okay. Because this is not a dangerous place. This is a place with a lot of potential if you are long term. Okay. If you're going to do something good for the country, you're going to benefit. Okay. And let me put it this way. Having worked in China... Uh, and many other countries, um, we're trying to prevent uh, investors, foreign investors coming in and in the first wave losing money. Okay? This happened, as you know, very well in China. Absolutely, right? yes. Uh, we're trying to prevent that. We're trying to give them a good deal, a fair deal, and our government sometimes bend backwards to accommodate that. Hmm. Okay? But you've got to be responsible. And you've got to have a conscience. Okay. But if you come here and all you want is profit, I think you, it's problematic. Okay. All right. Excellent. Serge, hold that thought. We're going to take a quick break and our coverage here at the World Economic Forum. Uh, East Asia, our discussion on the way forward for Myanmar continues after this. Okay, so what's happening now is we're taking a pretend break, a commercial break. We're not actually making any money on it yet. <laughs> Maybe later. But, uh, so we'll uh, pause for uh, about a minute or so, and then we'll resume. Welcome back. Uh, thanks for staying with us here at the World Economic Forum. Our discussion, panel discussion, continues on the way forward for Myanmar. We left off uh, with some thoughts from uh, Serge Pun. Let's uh, swing over to the other side and bring in uh, Mike here. Serge made a statement, this is not, this is a safe country. Do you agree? Well, I think this is one of these uh, interim stages where brand Myanmar has been defined. And I think most foreign investors, after the first time having experience uh, with Myanmar, and even this conference, I think people form their own, uh, their own views. That's why issues around law and order, uh, governance, uh, are so important, because this is what will encourage foreign investors in the future. You only have to look at some of the less successful examples around the world who are still 20 years later trying to live down issues of, of law and order, of corruption. So uh, I think the government policy settings are absolutely critical and the reputation that business investors have formed in these early years is going to be uh, part of the long-term success of Myanmar. Mm, interesting. Now, earlier on, we were talking about the agriculture part. You're obviously the other end of the scale, services, professional services. Do you even think about stuff like farming? Well, we, absolutely, because uh, the experience we have is that those economies which have balanced economies are the ones that actually get through ultimately through the middle income trap. And you've got to play to your advantages. You know, you've got a resource-based economy, You've got the low-cost manufacturing in the special economic zones. You've got the resources sector. You're between the two largest countries in the world uh, with growing middle class with a population of 71 million people. 
you can have a very balanced economy here mm. if you actually have the framework right. And what foreign investors look for is clear direction as to uh, what the government wants you to invest in long term in terms of private sector investment and what are the rules and what it doesn't want you to do term to in, in building long term sustainability. So mm. uh, it's a question of understanding the government motives and then working in partnership uh, with the community to basically establish those and make sure that you have a long term sustainable business and brand in this really important market. Ms. Clark, from Toxic, you've had with officials, do you get the sense that they are determined not to let the resource curse happen here in Myanmar? Well, it's, I've been really um, impressed at the way government officials have opened up and listened in the last uh, two days, and I find them very responsive. And I think if you actually look at the resource sector, the gas sector is one sector here that's working really well. Why? It's been going for 20 years. They already have good joint venture partners in place. Everyone understands the rules. They comply with the international standards and governance. And you're getting very competitive bidding. You're getting very good foreign investment, which is, again, starting to translate into economic outcomes. You have the telco licenses at the moment mm. underway. There will be a whole series of these come through the next few years. And it's really important that these processes be seen to be transparent, mm -hmm. level playing field, mm -hmm. and open uh, to international are, standards. Are IPPs likely to be next? Is that what you understand? Um, I'm not sure uh, about PPPs yeah. as such, but uh, I think there's any number of sectors that are really important uh, yeah. going forward that need to be opened up for private sector investment. We only have to see across our client base the number of people, for example, in consumer markets that are looking here at the moment and want some understanding about property rights. How can they establish their retail stores here? We look at the banking sector. People are wanting to know how they can get a branch licence here to provide funding to their clients that are in, in this marketplace. You know, even we, we look to see what are basically the local licensing rules and be able to audit the books of the major companies that are here to access capital markets and to give them confidence overseas. So mm. there's quite an extensive program over the next few years that needs to be worked through okay. with clear, precise regulation. And we've got a role to basically help mm -hmm. government understand those priorities okay. and what are the rules that operate in different countries. Okay, we've been talking about rules and reg regulations, etc., things that are on people. Let's move uh, over and talk about people, if we could, uh, Ms. Clark. You know, lots been, uh, a lot has been uh, 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 talked about in terms of Myanmar's infrastructure deficit, but it's human capital deficit. Literally two decades where, as a result of mismanagement of education, you have a population which is not very well equipped for the modern age, I think it would be fair to say. From the UNDP's point of view, where do you start? I mean, you, you can't grow or educate a person overnight. Well, th th there will be a lost generation in the years when the education system wasn't what one would wish it could be. And I think when we're, we're talking about the future of education, it's not not only investing in today's young people, which is absolutely critical, uh, but also trying to help those who did miss out to uh, catch up. I think adult education, adult extension will be important uh, as well. But it, it may be a case in this, this race to the future now of, of let a thousand flowers bloom. We're hearing some quite exciting examples of, uh, for example, the technology sector uh, coming in and what it can do with its specific skills training and, and modules and, and, and so on. So. I think it will be a, a mix of investment in a better quality public education system, but also looking in this, this race for quality growth mm. uh, for uh, spin-offs in the private sector investment and how they upskill staff as well. <laughs> if I could just make a comment on what Indra said sure. uh, about uh, her approach at Pepsi. I, I think this is a model approach to talk about a value chain approach for the, for the local people. Uh, and, and really see your capacity to do well here is so linked to the opportunities that you open up for the small producer. I think that's very, very encouraging to hear from a major corporate. Can okay. I tell you, most mm. of our success stories have come when we set up mm. that virtual circle. We did the same in Mexico with sunflower. We planted sunflower with the farmers in Mexico, but we bought the crop from them and then allowed them to keep this virtual circle going. Then we used the crop to make sunflower oil and use it in our snack production. So when you set up that model, you actually put income back in the hands of the farmers. That creates a very virtuous circle. But talking about skills building, if I may just add, Helen, one of the unique problems in Myanmar that was flagged to us this morning was the fact that young men, or young boys, are dropping out of school at a very early age. And the girls are going on to study. And so there's really a mismatch as you get into college and higher levels. It's more than two-thirds women. I think there's an issue of finding a way to bring 
young boys back into the education system and retraining them so that you don't have a skew in society. Mm. It's an additional challenge in Myanmar. Serge, I don't know if that's something that was mentioned in the panel this morning. Well, I also heard it for the first time. Uh -huh. But if that's true, then we'll be ruled by women very soon. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Myanmar is going to be great. <laughs> Which might not be a bad thing. Who knows, right? <laughs> Minister, let me bring you in on this. We were talking about um, technology uh, a while ago. Ms. Clark was. When I think of India, I think many people think of IT services, of course. And if you rep uh, read reports like the recent one out from McKinsey, they draw attention to the possibility that, you know, Myanmar opening up now is actually an advantage because they can make a leap a technology leap. Forget the copper, laying wires go straight to wireless and straight to the internet. And this could be a huge driver of development. Do you believe that? Of course. And therefore, investment in human resources is important. Institutions have to be built. That's what we believe in. We have already identified priority areas, particularly in the field of education science and technology, information technology in particular, and also training and skills. We have already established a center of excellence in IT sector in Yangon. We are going to establish now an information technology institute like a university in Mandalay. In addition to that, we also uh, we have established one in Pokoku. We are doing another one the industrial skills training centers. So that would help in creating opportunities, not only for the younger people in particular, because Myanmar has huge uh, young population, uh, given the demographic profile of the country and the potential that youth have. Mm. So if they are empowered with more investments coming in, uh, with the multinationals, corporate entities, or the public sector entities, they will need skilled people. And that's what we're seeking to do. Besides that, in our institutions in India, we are taking young people from Myanmar on our scholarship programs. In fact, we had doubled last year when Prime Minister came here the number of scholarships, and they come to our professional institutions. Mm -hmm. We are looking at more sectors, uh, not restricting only to technology or medicine, engineering, information technology or agriculture, but going well beyond that, and specialized training programs which we have in mind, which we'll do in, the, in our institutions, but also help in establishing mm. centers here, including, uh, we were talking this morning, in the textile sector, silk sector, hand looms, so that people living in the rural areas are empowered, and at the same time, when we're talking of high end of skills, people have to be, the youth in particular, to be made employable. That is a part of our engagement because it's not only the private sector, but also the state as such. Mm. So we have a developmental assistance program in our engagement, which is huge, plus our corporate entities, public sector and private sector, who are coming uh, to invest. And investment means manufacturing, uh, value addition and job creation. Mm. Okay. I'm just thinking, you know, while the new generation literally of Myanmar's get uh, trained as well as schooled, uh, there needs to be a bit of a filler. And I think, Serge, we've talked about this before. Myanmar's who live, have studied or uh, worked abroad coming back, seeing vast opportunities to hear you and Dita are hiring uh, many of them. But is there a flip side to this? Because some of these people are possibly so disconnected from what should be their, their home country, I mean, do they in the end really help? There is, there is no doubt that even the Myanmar nationals who have lived overseas for many, many years amassed uh, their knowledge and now come back to work to help um, needs adjustments. Uh, the adjustments are mainly pertaining to trying to apply what they have learned to local conditions. Mm -hmm. Because you can expect, um, the, the catch word is, let's become international. Well, 
I think there's a lot of pitfalls being international for the sake of being international. Uh, if you just join yourself being a local company, then you really will have a lot of problem operating here. So uh, using international standards, international mindset, international values that are commonly accepted, and trying to adopt it to local conditions is what is needed. Mm. And these, we call them repats, have got to go through that adjustment just the same. Mm. Just the same as an expat would have to, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so we're trying very much to, to bring that gap smaller, bringing up the, our local staff, their, their, their capacity, their knowledge, and then hoping also that the people who come back help them, but also they would have to adjust. So it's quite a bit of challenge there. Mm. Okay. Serge, you are, of course, uh, a lot of people call Serge, I guess, the poster boy for the opening up of uh, Myanmar and a nobleman among entrepreneurs uh, here. We've had this discussion before. I asked you, Serge, you know, people talk about the risks, the challenges of operating in Myanmar, but you've managed to build a fairly sprawling sort of conglomerate uh, with fingers in a lot of different pies, and I asked you how you did it. You didn't really give me an answer, but you said, it's easy. Uh, I explain a little bit more. Well, to be honest, half of the companies we have, and we have, I think, maybe 40 of them in the group, um, grew organically. You start a service, and you find that this service is very much in need, and when you started it, you actually wanted to service your own companies. Within a very short period of time, um, you will be servicing the society, mm -hmm. and 80% of your contracts will be third-party contracts. Mm -hmm. So it becomes an independent, standalone company. And that is because the market requires that service so badly. Uh, I'll give you an example. We have a, a real estate project. We hire 50 security guards because it's a gated community. Uh, pretty soon, the neighbor says, oh, you seem to be doing a good job, can you do my security? And then the companies come and the embassies come and before you know, you have a security force of 800 security staff. Mm -hmm. It's a standalone company now. So these are what I call organic growth. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not because we're a genius. Okay? The market needs it. And in the service sector particularly, there is an enormous amount of need even today, maybe more so today, for service companies to come in mm. and service what is needed. So um, I don't think it's very difficult. No. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. You know, we were talking uh, earlier on about something else, and that is the role of the military in an economy, uh, in a country. And I wanted to know, I wanted to ask you whether there was too much crowding out here in Myanmar. Is that the case? I would uh, worry less in Myanmar about the military or SOEs. Okay? In other countries, emerging markets, uh, in particular, let's say China, um, the advantages that SOEs have, the state-owned enterprises have, is so distinct um, as compared to the private enterprise. Okay? But Myanmar, as it happens today, has got a very unfavorable climate for proliferation of SOEs. And in fact, the government is very adamant to privatize a lot of the state-owned enterprises, which have proven to be unsuccessful because of the system, because of the lack of motivation uh, of, for the people who work there. So there is no climate for that to grow. And, and for that purpose, uh, in that respect, I think it is a great time for entrepreneurship to, to, to grow and to, to flower. Hmm. So um, this is indeed a very fertile ground okay. for entrepreneurs. Okay, excellent. We're going to take a quick break. Our discussion here at the World Economic Forum on the way forward for Myanmar continues after this. So, uh, the
So while we're taking this uh, artificial commercial break, uh, just to let you know, towards the end again, we're going to have questions and answers. We'll, we'll try to involve you. This mic is not on. Okay. Could, could somebody turn my mic up? Okay, welcome back uh, to the World Economic Forum. We're continuing our conversation here on the way forward for uh, Myanmar. And uh, Helen Clark Surge here was talking about the military and business and, and SOEs and whether that crowds out private enterprise. You and I talked about this earlier on. How good a model is Indonesia for Myanmar in the sense uh, how they transitioned away from too much dominance by the military in politics as well as in business and the economy? Well, I think one of the most useful things in development these days is sharing experiences between countries uh, across the South. And there are plenty of experiences out there of transition from uh, quite authoritarian regimes, uh, military-backed regimes, to something different. And I think uh, Indonesia has a lot of experience to share uh, with that. You know, again, you know, think back 20 years ago to how uh, Indonesia was and, and where it is today as a functioning uh, democracy with tremendous respect for the path that it's, it's travelled. So you know, while no one will want to say, I'm your model, on the other hand, sharing experiences is, is extremely important. Okay. And, and I think it is a, a relevant one. I wanted to come in a little bit on what Serge said about the, the role of the uh, expatriate, uh, if you like, and, and entirely agree that it can be quite difficult for people to come home and, and fit in. Uh, the salary structure may be very different. They're used to operating in a different environment. And I don't think we should think that it's just coming home uh, that's the only way to help your country. Actually, if there's a skilled, well-placed uh, diaspora out there, it can be creating vital connections for Mian the new Myanmar, uh, for its uh, entrepreneurs, for, for its youth, uh, to connect with that wider world. So you know, no, one, no one should feel, unless I come home, I'm not being patriotic. You can be patriotic and help your country with the connections that you've made in, in the life that you've got out there. Okay, let's, let's move on to talk about physical connections, if we could, infrastructure. And we had an interesting discussion a few minutes ago as uh, well. Uh, in, I mean, one of the great advantages of this country, of course, that a lot of people talk about is that it is basically sandwiched between east and west and is, is a physical uh, connection. Um, Land routes, especially, the Japanese are very, have been very interested in this for, uh, for decades, but the main plans and ideas now for physical road connectivity are what? Well, connectivity and infrastructure we view as vital, very important, when we engage with Myanmar and beyond. You have to look at the map. India shares a 1,600-kilometer long border with China, uh, with, sorry, Myanmar. And with Myanmar, four of the northeastern states of India, that's Manipur, Mizoram, uh, then we have Nagaland and Arunachal, four st uh, crucial states. And they are also landlocked. When you look at northern Myanmar and northeastern India, with the vast potential, biodiversity, young population, the need of connectivity is an imperative. 
we are now working towards that india is developing a kaladan multimodal transport corridor that's on the kaladan river including building bridges development of a port in setwe and a river line port uh, which we are almost there but uh, we could not reach the point but we have stopped at palewa and therefore the road component has increased so it will be about anywhere uh, 280 to 85 km long that will ensure connectivity and with the development of the port the maritime linkages the shipping linkages between the calcutta port and the setwe port will develop besides this corridor india is working very closely with myanmar and thailand to develop the trilateral highway as we call it as linking uh, zoipui in india that's in mizoram through myanmar as a long highway to thailand and mysore now we are halfway there and say i'm sure that by 2015 2015 2016 they should be fully operational in other words it will be ready for this whole idea of an asean It's economic community yes you see because it will connect india northeastern india myanmar with asean countries now we are already engaged uh, myanmar is a member of asean India is a mem member of East Asia Summit. We are part of the ASEP, the Regional Economic Cooperation, as it is evolving, uh, and it is very important for this region and for the world what's happening. Mm. We have a very focused national initiative, which is called the Look East Policy, <coughs> and this would be a very important aspect of that Look East Policy. Myanmar and India. have historic relationship cultural linkages shared experiences similar developmental challenges parts of india and myanmar mm. and also when we look at some of the ethnic groups and their linkages the cultural influences for india this country is of a bridge head and gateway to the asean countries and eventually as was said earlier mm -hmm. that it will connect right up to cambodia and we had the car rally nice. prior to the commemorative uh, summit between asean and india marking 20 years of india asean engagement in november december mm -hmm. and the car rally covered the entire route mm -hmm. so it is very much there okay. certain parts of it which need to be upgraded developed that's exactly what we are doing okay so thailand like is doing its bit and myanmar is doing its bit okay sounds exciting and also like a, a huge physical undertaking but indra when you hear um ideas like that for physical connectivity how much does it really mean for you because you prefer to to make in country for the market no well but physical connectivity helps because even within the country we need an infrastructure highways road rail to move our products yeah. to bring the crop from the farms and then send manufactured product back into all of the cities and towns and so without a very good highway system it's very mm -hmm. hard to transport okay. and with the uh, trade agreement that exists within ASEAN uh, you know it's very easy for us to manufacture in the ASEAN for the ASEAN country so moving agriculture across even moving finished goods across ASEAN is important mm. and a lot of the uh foods and beverages today especially the packaged foods and beverages uh, have a lot of uh, bulk so it's very important that uh when you ha have to move the trucks you have the shortest possible time between production and the point of display mm. and from the farm shortest possible time from the farm to the point of manufacture so i think the more you invest in infrastructure the lower the cost of the supply chain is going to be Okay. and the cheaper the product is going to be for the end consumer mm -hmm. so can't be fast enough on all the work that you're doing with the Myanmar government because i think it'll help the overall food chain and it'll actually reduce prices to consumers okay sir does this mean anything for you and your businesses we're not in the construction business <laughs> but uh, i'm sure it opens up a lot of opportunities for uh, construction companies infrastructure companies mm -hmm. and so forth we're a developer um, basically but for us you know all what we're talking about is an immense opportunity over the coming 5 to 10 years okay, as 
the so-called middle class comes up, um, there's a need for virtually everything, mm. from housing to schools to, to services, uh, leisure, entertainment, everything. Mm -hmm. So um, I do feel that uh, the future is very, very bright for yeah. any type of business. Okay, without giving too much away, as, as a local entrepreneur, where do you see the most immediate opportunities as, as foreign investment comes in, as momentum keeps up for opening? Well, the low-hanging fruits are, are, are what everybody sees. The hospitality industry is very easy to enter, and it's very much uh, needed. Okay. We had, um, for the first time um, in probably uh, 15 years, uh, surpassed one million visitors coming to Myanmar last year. Mm. We've always wavered around 250 to 350,000 visitors a year, a year. Now that compares to like 15, 17 million a year in Thailand, you know, probably more in Singapore mm. and Hong Kong. And even Cambodia gets 3 million tourists a year. We got 300,000 every year for many years. Mm. For the first time, we passed a million. Mm. The plan of the government is hopefully that we will reach 3 million by 2015, which is very reachable. But that's that's um, exponential growth, mm. exponential demand. Uh, you're talking of demand that is not 2x, 3x, but maybe 7x, 10x. Mm -hmm. So I think um, hospitality in tea industry is very much needed. Supporting that, of course, is your logistics. If you have 300 me million peop uh, 3 million people coming to your country, how do you transfer them from point A to point B? Where do they eat? What do they do? And all the things that goes with it. So um, we find that we are in a uh, very urgent need to build up the capacity. The investment part, I think, is the easy part because there's no shortage of people queuing at the door trying to invest, build a hotel, build this, build that. But the capacity, the software, where are the uh, staff that will man the hotel, and so forth. Mm. Um, these are the issues that I think uh, we need to address. All right. Uh, Mike, you want to come in on this? Yeah, I want to just summarize the last conversation because you know, recently we've done a, quite a benchmarking of just the uh, infrastructure gap that exists within ASEAN, but uh, within uh, Myanmar to the rest of ASEAN. And, but I think the great advantage that Myanmar has is, first of all, that no longer do individual foreign investors look at this on a country basis. Look at the region. You know, look at what's the supply channel into India? What's the supply channel into ASEAN? What's the supply channel into China? Mm -hmm. So therefore, it's also in the interest of the neighbouring countries to basically assist and help, uh, just as Minister Sharma described, in having a sort of collaborative partnership about building something which is greater for the region. And I think that's a wonderful opportunity for a country like Myanmar to participate, just given its geographic edge at the moment. Okay, interesting. You know, we, we had an opportunity to talk this morning as well. And uh, Surge raised a number, a magic number, 3 million people by 2015, correct? Mm -hmm. So that would be triple the estimated amount of people, number of people who are expected to visit this year. We spent some time with uh, a gentleman from, from Visa. And you probably won't be surprised to know that he was very excited about this. Because now Visa, also MasterCard, is accepted in Myanmar. <coughs> but he said, look, that's just the beginning and the tip of the iceberg. We'll make our early money that way, but of course, obviously, we're looking in-country, 60-odd million people. And he's already made connections with several banks here, local banks. But one, one thing I thought is, look, there's still a very deep-seated culture here where people don't usually open bank accounts. There have been runs on banks historically. That, that hasn't been unusual. How do you change that? Because this is a place with a very rudimentary financial system. Well, first of all, I think you start with microfinance education. And you develop a product which is adapted to the local community of the market. Something that they can understand very readily within their own local village and how it applies. The second thing you have to do is actually build you know, a, 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 an infrastructure, a prudential, super, a prudential supervision, which makes sure that they have confidence that a party like 
the government is effectively guaranteeing the safety of their deposits. And all of a sudden they become, start to become sophisticated and all of a sudden it becomes the, the, the loan for the car and then the loan on the house and then gradually becomes a loan for a small business. And uh, all of a sudden, it, uh, if the examples of other countries are such, it becomes part of the norm. But that uh, initial phase of winning confidence is critically important. This is why reform of the financial sector here, to me, is a very, very major priority, because not only does it sponsor foreign direct investment, but it'll start domestic consumption in a way that the country hasn't seen before. Hmm, interesting. Uh, yes, go ahead, Serge. Uh, if I may, uh, Martin, if I may uh, correct some of the misconception here about what you mentioned just about uh, our consumers being probably very rudimentary uh, in their knowledge of how to use financial services. I think that that's actually wrong because I, what I actually meant was the system or what systems do that do exist are rudimentary. Well, we, our first opening, this country, the first opening is not today. We call it a second spring. Mm. The first opening was 1990. In 1988, we had a change of government from, uh, uh, and we, we had, uh, at that time was called SLOC. State Law Order Restoration Council. And in 1990, the first Foreign Investment Act was promulgated. It was a very good Foreign Investment Act. Mm -hmm. And that was when the foreigners started coming in. And from 1990 to nine, uh, 2003, we had 13 good years of economic growth. As a matter of fact, I visited Vietnam uh, and various other emerging economies at those times. We were far ahead. I can tell you for a fact, our banking services, banking industry was liberalized in 1993 when they allowed private banks to be set up. And there were eight of us private banks. Okay? We had home mortgages with credit cards, albeit just domestic credit cards. We had uh, trade financing, we had higher purchase, we had everything. It is only at 19, uh, 2003, when we, had, we hit a financial crisis and there was mismanagement, some very bad decisions, and they start closing down. Mm. All credit cards were cancelled uh, within a span of a month. You got to pay back everything. Home mortgages were cancelled. You got to pay back within so many months. Mm -hmm. uh, credit was taken away from the market just like that. Okay? And you can imagine it was like a pond where you have a lot of fish swimming happily and then you let the water out and what happens to the fish? Uh, they die. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our economy died overnight. And we went into a tailspin, a negative tailspin. Many foreigners come today and think this is the first time we opened. Mm. It is the first time we have democracy. But it's not the first time we have economic, uh, economic reform. Okay. All right. So we hope that some of the mismanagement will be corrected and the banking sector will come back, even if it comes back to its own 1996, 97, 2002 um, level, it would be quite good. Okay. Serge, thank you very much. We'll take a quick break. Our conversation continues on the way forward for Myanmar at the World Economic Forum after this. That's a good point. Uh, this is going to be our last one. Where, where would you like to take it? We haven't really talked about politics or security. Is that something that you would like to address? Yeah?
All right, welcome back. Thanks for staying with us at the World Economic Forum for our conversation on the way forward for uh, Myanmar. And Helen Clark, let me come to you. Um, people like to use a lot of phrases about uh, to describe Myanmar, frozen in time, arrested, development, all sorts of things. But it's pretty clear that right now, with the opening over the last two years, there is a great opportunity to start, if not from scratch, at least very much sort of clean sheet. Is Myanmar in a position to be one of the very first countries in the world to think very long term? I'm thinking 25, 30 years with an economic blueprint. Well, pro probably right now for leaders who are engaged in a very complex uh, reform process, they're, they're looking to the end of the year and beyond and what legislation you have to pass and how you get ready for the next <coughs> set of elections and so on. And mm. It's hard to come up for air in, in, these, in these, uh, these times. But for sure, if a, if a clear national vision projecting out uh, can be uh, communicated, there's a chance then to align what you want from your partners uh, with that and, and really go for it. And no matter how great the pressures of the moment are, it is important to be thinking, well, you know, okay, we're going to reach this benchmark, but what next? There will be more hills beyond, so keep your eye on the, on the longer term as, as well. I'm quite interested in the discussion about the, the banking services because you know, around the world, one of the issues for poor people is nowhere safe to put their money, so it tends to go under the mattress and that's, that's very vulnerable. But uh, there's now this tremendous linkage we're seeing between the rollout of information and communications technology and mobile banking services for, for poor people. So the, the sooner this connectivity can come with the ICT rollout, the sooner we can see more poor people have access to banking services. And I, I look at Kenya and the phenomenal revolution of mobile banking there is, is really a, a, a model and experience to be shared as rapidly as possible. Michael? Oh, I'd just endorse that. I mean, one of the real success factors for Africa these days is just the uh, incredible use of, uh, of mobile phones and uh, for all sorts of day-to-day -day activities. And particularly when you're looking at also fostering an SME sector, you know, your, your, your market entry these days has been reduced dramatically mm -hmm. because of the technology that's available. So I couldn't uh, agree more with Helen. Okay, let me bring up a, a subject and an issue which is sensitive, controversial, touchy, but which we really have to talk about, and that is corruption. In terms of rankings, Myanmar is still quite a ways uh, down there. How do you change that? Well, I think it needs leadership absolutely from the top that this won't be tolerated. Uh, a culture of impunity has to be dealt to. You need strong rule of law. You need a judiciary that's reformed and able to do with it, deal with it. You need to build codes of ethics and, convict, uh, and um, of conduct in your public service and administration. Uh, you need a, a parliament with teeth that's prepared to really examine government accounts and budgets and say, where did the money go? You need the free media and you need an active civil society. So it's not one swing of the wheel to tackle uh, uh, the corruption issue. Now we can see that you know, some of these elements are in place. The, the press is uh, operating uh, you know, pretty, pretty freely. The, the, the parliament now has an opposition which is, which, which is vocal. So I think in the administrative and civil service reform, this is something that really has to be highlighted now so that you complement that kind of democratic reform with institutional reform around integrity. It may need specific integrity institutions to be built. Some countries uh, go that way, others rely more on generic rule of law and open accountability and transparency. But, but for sure, it, it needs to be tackled. Okay, Andrew? Well, I think this goes again to the discussion we had, I think, the first segment, the pace of growth. Mm. If we pace the rate of growth, um, I think you won't have this mad rush for business and then everybody starts to open up suitcases of whatever it takes to make your licenses come to life. I think in corruption there's a corruptor and a corruptee. Mm. Uh, if the corruptors who want to rush in and do things here can check themselves, uh, I think life would be so much better. So I think there's a lot of education to be done and goes back to your question you asked, uh, Helen, if you have a systematic plan to grow the country, which I'm sure the Myanmar government is doing, mm. I think that will guide the pace of change, the pace of development, mm -hmm. that can in fact anticipate and address some of these issues 
okay. on rapid growth and what can, that can do. All right, we to, have just uh, a, a couple of minutes left. I want to do this. If we could just go all the way around, start starting with you, Serge. <clears throat> Imagine with me or for me, if you could, Myanmar 25, 30 years from now, what kind of country is it going to be? Describe it. My hope. Okay, your hope. Okay. If we were to differ ourselves with anybody else in the region, I hope that we would be building an economy on some very solid grounds. There are a lot of traces and indications that we're already starting to do it. The government is trying very hard to um, um, follow through with anti-corruption, anti-graft, level playing field, uh, anti-cronyism, etc., etc. These reforms, unfortunately, do not show the effects immediately. But 20 years from now, I hope they will be the, the foundation on which our economy sits. And then we will be different. We've always have a saying that why is it that you cannot compete with Hong Kong and Singapore even though they are so, so small as a city state? The rule of law, the, the, the absence of corruption, transparency, good governance, all this makes them unbeatable as a place to do business. We have too many countries that have prospered economically and went light on these reforms and now they want to reform. Mm. But the economic interests or special interest bodies are so strong mm -hmm. they cannot reform. Mm. Okay. I hope we don't get into that rut. Okay. All right. Inter? I think actually 25 years from now we're all going to look back and think of the WEF, the World Economic Forum in Myanmar and say a lot of the debate started then. Um, interesting time in the evolution of Myanmar, but 25 years from now, this is the no longer an Asian tiger, but the Asian jaguar, the Asian cheetah, because it's really sprung forward, taken all the lessons from other countries, the mistakes and the good lessons, and brought it to bear on Myanmar to build a sustainable, well thought through economy. And we want to be part of that economy, we want to be part of growing with Myanmar for Myanmar. Okay. Yeah. Anand? Well, with the reforms and democracy, both development as well as nation building is on. It's also going to un uh, unleash a wave of entrepreneurship in this country. And what will be done today, of course it will take a long time when we are talking of institution building in infrastructure development, but the benefits of that, or the rewards, will be clearly visible 20 years down the line. And this country will be able to, in partnership with its neighbors and also with the other major countries of the world, benefit A, from the technologies that are available and accessible, be a partner when it comes to development, and bridge the developmental divide. Therefore, the generations which will be there and generations to follow would have immensely benefited from the nation building that is on. Okay. Ms. Clark. I, I think the goal is by 2030 for the country to be a middle income country. That has to be achievable. There's no reason why Myanmar projecting out to there can't uh, be thinking of where Thailand is today, where Indonesia is today. I would hope as part of that package it sees eradicating extreme poverty yeah. Uh, and also uh, reaching permanent peace and settlements with uh, the minority peoples uh, because you know, conflict de-develops, it, it, it underdevelops, yeah. and that's, uh, that's been a problem. I think Indra's caution about you know, not, not going too fast uh, so that you, you know, outstrip your capacity to do things well is, is important. And, and one thing that always concerns me about wholesale and very rapid privatisation is there, there won't be a lot of people in a position locally to take advantage of that. So you can build an oligarchical uh, uh, class, which again concentrates mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of wealth. So I'd, I'd, I'd be looking for you know, how, how the wealth can be better distributed, better shared okay. as the country comes up. Okay, Mike. 
Matt and a, and a role model of sustainable, well-balanced development uh, where the country's produced a thousand surge poons. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about that, sir? Well, they get cloned nowadays. Isn't it? Well. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Uh, to all our panelists and experts, thank you so very much for uh, talking with us. And we hope you've enjoyed our discussion here at the World Economic Forum on the way forward for Myanmar. Thanks for watching. Okay. So now comes the fun part. We've done the TV part. You guys can actually <coughs> talk. Uh, questions, comments? Raise your hand. A mic will come to you. There you go, sir, right at the end. Hi, Ken Chun from the uh, local company. I'm in the, involved in the energy sector. So the, if you look at the recent report, we have a new investment coming in. Uh, FDI last year was 1.4 billion, of which uh, the, uh, the, the, the majority of uh, 400, 400 million goes to the manufacturing, and then the, the oil and gas and the, uh, the power, 300 million each, and the, 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 the rest is the hotel, like uh, such say. And then uh, the, uh, the we have to think about the president, uh, the uh, the plan for the GDP, where they want to uh, he expect less of the contribution from the agriculture sector, and uh, he expect more on the uh, manufacturing and the uh, the service, and the uh, not to forget. I, uh, and also, there's a, uh, we need to actually look at the uh, even though the Japan uh, Japan are not investing right now at the world, uh, we also need to figure out. We also need to think about the Japan factor in the. The, uh, the, the, in, in the Myanmar uh, growth, which is, uh, the, 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 uh, I understand, I see that there's something like, they want to put it, uh, the Myanmar as the man, uh, manufacturing, uh, the, 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 the kind of facility hub in, in the South Asia. Mm. And uh, just to give you about the, uh, the agriculture, uh, the mainly uh, we have uh, the, uh, the agriculture, the, 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 the farming coming in the, uh, from the ARD and the Shen State. Now the, uh, it's actually happening only. Hmm. And if you look at the Karen state, which is the, the Andic uh, area, a lot of people go to the uh, Thailand hmm. to walk. So you see those land full of the elephant grass. Hmm. And then if you look at the, uh, the uh, how do you call it, the, the area side, there's something, uh, the, some climate things or whatever happened. So anyway, so we, but everybody believes that we have a role. Myanmar has a role in terms of the regional connectivity, and uh, we are also playing a very big role in the uh, regional energy supply. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also have uh, some role in the manufacturing. Yeah. So with this background, so will you change again about this, uh, the Myanmar as uh, the way forward as the, the, uh, the playing bigger role in the agriculture sector? So that's uh, like, I'd, I'd like to ask this question to Okay, who would panel. you like to respond? All panel. Because okay. I, I heard some, some, uh, somebody say the uh, agriculture will be there. The uh, way forward, we and the we see uh, some uh, the uh, the agriculture. Who, who would like to tackle well, that, Helen? I think some of us have said it's, it's it's the quick win for poverty eradication now, but for sure, one would like to see a you know sort of short medium term future where there's enough energy, water, infrastructure mm -hmm. to fuel uh, the offshore processing from <laughs> countries like Japan. Now, it, it, it's not happening at any great pace now because that basic infrastructure isn't there to drive it, uh, but. There will be a time when it will be, but but I, you know, all, all I can say, looking around the world, the, if, if you've got um, such a significant proportion of your people living in a rural sector now, you better focus on that sector, because people are looking for quick quick wins for their standard of living around yeah. their water, their sanitation, their basic uh, basic incomes, and, yeah. and, and you'll get it with some relatively cost-effective investments there. Indeed, I would agree. It seems fairly obvious. Uh, other questions or comments? Ma'am, on the right. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Annalisa Valaris. I'm the CEO of Women's Sphere. I'd love to ask about the role of the empowerment of women and girls in the economic development of Myanmar. If you could comment um, on what your thoughts are on what it would take to close the gender gap in economic participation, political participation, and education investments, and how you think this will impact the long-term economic development of the country. And who would you like to answer that? Um, I'd love to get comments from the panel. From the panel, okay. Um, Sir, you know the best about women in Myanmar. <laughs> if what Indra said is right just now, the, uh, the balance is to protect men. 
Because hey, oh, wait a second. You don't need any protection, Serge. <laughs> we will have two thirds of graduates all female. Means uh, a lot more female executives, female engineers, female doctors. No, but seriously, I think um, discrimination against women, in my own mind, is not a serious issue here. Unlike many that we have seen in South Asia or in uh, certain areas which are at, on headline news. A uh, woman has a very high uh, position, not only in the society, in the family. They're always the boss. Okay? Most of my uh, Myanmar friends uh, go back and hand the whole salary package to them right away. Mm. And then get a, like get a petty cash on a daily basis. So they are the boss. But uh, Professionally, I think if you look at it, there is no such thing as you don't get a position because you're a woman. Wow. If, if it's of any uh, um, measure, we have a bank. Um, we have 2,000 employees. At this moment, I have 51 branch managers, of which 42 are women. Mm. I have only nine men that are wow. managers. Interesting. Helen, would you like to weigh in? Well, I, I'd like to start with a comment on the political participation. Uh, the last elections in this country, of course, were, were run with the, the dominant party being basically a party that's coming out of a, a government very military influenced. And women obviously don't have too many high places in the military. So we've ended up with a parliament which is under 6% female. Now, that, that is just too low. You know, the Millennium Development Goal target is, is 30 per cent. And I would really hope that uh, for the next elections in Myanmar in a couple of years, there can be a huge effort made uh, to push for women to come forward to be members of parliament. Because the, the truth is, unless you have a critical mass of women, you don't get the issues raised. The women feel too lonely. They don't get the support for raising them. You, you need to aim much, much higher. And even if it means taking special measures uh, to get that participation up, it, 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 it has to come up. And, and then also look uh, in this presidential system for more women to be appointed to the ministerial positions and, and so on as well. So I, I think that's important. We normally talk about a package of political and economic empowerment and legal status and rights. Uh, so you have to approach <coughs> the, the three together. All right, excellent. Anand? Well, democracy will address the issues of both disparities, alleged discrimination, or women lagging behind, particularly uh, when it comes to economic administrative positions. It's not one country, but many countries who are seeking to address this challenge. And the empowerment of the women will come through education, financial inclusion, and ensuring that the women access the opportunities that are created with economic growth. Okay, Anand, thank you so much. Folks, we'll have to leave it there and wrap it up. Thank you so much for being a part of this and coming. We'll see you next year. Thank you. 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 Thank you.